partisan in the issues that we study and nonpartisan in the positions that we take. Do not confuse nonpartisan with wishy washy. We are wishy washy. <laughs> <laughs> Said she who knows better. Uh, we study local issues and take positions after disciplined study on issues of public policy. There will be a question and answer period following the presentation of our two principal speakers, Andrea Kaminsky and Jay Hack. Andrea Kaminsky is Executive Director of the League of Women Voters, and you will hear more about her from, from uh, Margie. And Jay Hack is the Executive Director of Common Cause. You'll hear more about him. Um, I think you all have a file card, and if you don't, I think there are maybe enough to go around. Oh, yeah, we got more. Oh, good. And if the caution is one question per card, so if you have a second question with a different thrust, please use a different card. And we will have, we have a, a team over here that will be vetting for repetition. And so that we can sort of uh, gather cards with the same question together so it only has to be asked once. But it will not be vet, vetted for content and subject or Maybe language, if you are angry. Okay, you will be able to register for membership tonight. And the membership forms, I believe, are at that desk? No, no. They're all gone. Okay, well, um, leave your name and put a star. You want to register for membership. Uh, and I think we can handle that through. Our website is right here. You can, um, you can go and Register or uh, join right online. There you go. You heard it from the... Uh, something small. <laughs> uh, okay. our, our, our league is an at-large at league, which means we let the state league do some of the grant work. It's also an advantage uh, to people who want to contribute to nonpartisan leagues because uh, the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin is a 501c3, and you can deduct your contributions from your taxes. Uh, on the information side, our first meeting, and there's a, a hand note up here about the first meeting, and that, that will be an organizational meeting. It is July 13th, 6.30 at the library, July 13th, 6.30 at the library. It'll be initial organizing for the fall. We will talk about study groups and study topics. We will discuss programs for the fall and convenient meeting times. For some of you, sometimes they're impossible, uh, so we want to accommodate as many members as we can. Our next forum, this is the very first of all our forums, our next forum is going to be in September, and it's on CAFOs, Concentrated Animal Feed Operations. Uh, and it is, we'll deal with the Dunn County Study Groups on their final CAFO report. Tom Quinn, Chairman of uh, Planning Resources and De Development, will be the presenter. And the main thrust will be the results, the final report from, uh, it's now seven month, because it was extended seven and a half month, uh, study of the impact of CAFOs on uh, the local environment. So with that, I pass the program over to the moderator, Margie Hagman. One more thing. <laughs> See this? For those of you who don't know how to reach your legislators from the president on down, these little booklets are very, very handy, and you get them from the county clerk's office that's in the government center on the first floor. $2.11. What a bargain. Is there a date in September? We haven't said that yet, Sarah. Okay. But we will. We'll let you know. Thank you. Did you say your name, kids? Oh, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm Kit's Clary's. <laughs> I didn't hear it, and I thought she needed to say it. <laughs> okay, I'm Margie Hageman, and um, and some of us, and I'm re looking out over the group, and I recognize some of you that were involved with the League of Women Voters in the 80s when we had one here in, I had uh, a, a chapter here in, in Dunn County. And um, so we're revitalizing that and, and kind of um, uh, starting, starting over again. Um, thank you, kids. Today we're going to learn about political redistricting, or you might call it reapportionment, or commonly known as gerrymandering. And uh, I'm, it, there's a lot of, um, nationwide this is a really big issue, but in Wisconsin it's, uh, it's a very big issue too. And actually is, is in, uh, has gone to court and, and, they'll, uh, and, Jay, and um, Jay will talk about that in a little bit. Uh, after each census, then the, the um, voting districts are rewritten and they are redrawn. Sometimes the parties in power make decisions to redraw them around racial issues and sometimes around political uh, voting patterns. So that's what happens every 10 years. And it's both Democrats and Republicans that do this. So we have had ours, uh, and it has been questioned in many states, in North Carolina right now, you may have heard on the news, North Carolina and Alabama very recently have been, uh, been accused of, of racial um, redistricting. And that is not the case in Wisconsin. It is voting patterns, not racial issues. Although Jay may have an idea, may say differently, so we'll talk about that. Um, the court the federal court in Wisconsin has ruled that Wisconsin needs to change the way their voting districts by November of this year. And uh, that, but it has also been appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court hasn't made a decision about it. I'm not the expert on it, I'm, we're gonna bring in the expert on, on this. Our speakers will explain how gerrymandering works and uh, you will have a chance to also ask questions. If you have questions, be sure to put them on the card. And then raise your hand and someone will come by and pick up the question. And, um, and we can give you another card at the same time too if you have other questions. The decisions that are made in Wisconsin may have, will certainly have significance here in Wisconsin, but it may also have significance nationwide. So we, this is a very important issue nationwide, and we need to, we need to uh, really watch what's going on. Our two speakers today are, um, we have Andrea Kaminsky, um, who is from the League of Women Voters, and she's been the, uh, the CEO or the executive director of the uh, for since 2004. Um, she is a registered lobbyist for the, the uh, League of Women Voters in Wisconsin. So she, she does do lobbying and that is and has to be registered with the state. And we lobby on issues and, and positions and she'll tell you more about that. And we also have Jay Heck who is with the with Common Cause of Wisconsin, is the, the CEO there. He's been there 22 years uh, with the, with the and, and has worked in the legislature and before that. So we, and he is also a lobbyist that works for Common Cause. So I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew. Andrea Kaminsky. Thank you so much, Marty, for that introduction and um, and thanks, uh, kids. Uh, I want, and we're just so excited um, about this newly forming League of Women Voters of Greater Chippewa Valley. Um, <coughs> we're, um, we're so pleased to see so many of you here today. And, um, and I just want to thank uh, Kids Cleary, who initially 
contacted me about two years ago about the possibility of a league here and, um, and has, has worked that on it really ever since and really made it come to fruition. And, um, and then uh, now there are other new leaders who are stepping up as well into the leadership team. And um, so very excited to <coughs> be here with all of you. Um, and I want to thank you for inviting me to, your, to speak at your public event. And I'm really delighted to be here with my uh, colleague, Jay Heck from Common Cause. So about the League of Women Voters. It was founded in 1920 um, by the suffragists who had you know, completed a 75-year struggle to earn the right to vote for women. And they started this organization to educate women. Um, all of a sudden, there were 20 million new voters. Not 20 million new citizens, but 20 million citizens who were new voters in the country. And they wanted to be sure that women were um, educated um, about the issues and that, uh, and that women would have a voice in government because of, of the vote. Um, our mission now is to advocate for active and informed <laughs> participation in government by women, by men, by um, any eligible citizen. And uh, we don't think that it's all about voting either. We believe that citizenship is year round. And uh, so, and, and you know, we think once you, once you elect your representatives, it's important, it's equally important to keep them in, informed about how they're doing, about how you feel about the issues and, um, and so forth. When, um, when you've heard that the League is a nonpartisan organization, that means that we never endorse or support or oppose any political party or candidate. But as Kit said, we do take positions on issues. The League, um, in a grassroots sort of way, um, our members study issues that they've chosen to study. Um, they, they try to educate the public while educating themselves by holding forums like, like this um, this evening. And uh, then, they, then they, they come to consensus on, on kind of broad positions. And as you can imagine, since 1920, you know, 97 years, there's been time to study a lot of issues. So we have, we have positions in the good government issues like voting and uh, redistricting and also in uh, social policy, corrections, um, uh, health care, education, and so forth, as well as natural resources. And um, so uh, we have positions that we, we opposed the uh, high capacity wells bill that was signed today into law. And um, so we're, we're very active in that, in that area as well. But we never, and, and while we encourage, the League encourages members to be active in the parties um, of their choice. If you're on a, the leadership team, you don't do that. And when you're speaking for the League, or when you're um, working on these problems, you try to get past that partisan, partisanship and, um, and look at the issues on the merits of the issues and on the facts. We do believe in facts. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can be sure we have to say that. But you can be sure, you know, we don't favor one party or another. And so you can be sure that when you go to a League of Women Voters Candidate Answers Voter Guide, um, we, we post before our bigger elections on vote411.org, you can be sure that we sent the same questionnaire to all candidates, gave them the same opportunity to respond, and, and we're publishing their answers verbatim. We don't change them, we don't rate them, or anything like that. Now, sometimes our issues seem to line up with one party or another, but I can tell you that it's not consistent. We adopt our positions through this process I mentioned, and um, our positions, most of them are long held. We do occasional updates, but they're, we've held them for a long time. And actually redistricting is an example. Um, the League has been um, working on redistricting for decades. I think somebody had, uh, mentioned that uh, 
that the Dunn County League in the past worked on the state study about redistricting, uh, reapportionment actually, um, and that was 60s or 70s or something. The League since the 1970s has held a position that in the state, we believe that redistricting should be done by, um, by a, a nonpartisan entity, whether it's an independent commission or, or um, a nonpartisan agency. We, we just don't think that the legislators themselves should be allowed to choose their voters by how they draw the lines. And we have held that position since the 1970s. I can tell you that in my office, in the state uh, office, um, we have a letter from Dave Travis, who was a liberal Democrat and the uh, Speaker of the Assembly back in the 1980s. And he ripped into the league for the fact that we, we were supporting this Republican plan. <laughs> well, okay, so now the, the same position lines up with the Democrats. Our plan, our position did not change. All that changed was who was in power in the legislature at the time. So I, um, we continue to believe that the district should be drawn by, we're, we're now supporting the Iowa plan, which um, Jay will tell you about. Um, in the past six months, we filed, uh, we filed an amicus brief in the, law case, the lawsuit that you'll hear about, Whitford versus Gill, and we're planning to do so again this summer um, now that the case has been appealed to the Supreme Court. So I'd like to introduce you to Jay Heck, who knows far more about all this stuff than I do, and, uh, he'll, he'll, and he will um, tell you uh, more about the Whitford case and all of it. Thanks, Andrea. Welcome, everyone. This is in case I have a Marco Rubio moment. <laughs> it is uh, really a great pleasure for me to be here tonight. Uh, I have lived in Wisconsin for 30 years, and I've never been actually in Menominee, and it's a place I've always wanted to come uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, um, I knew your former state representative and congressman, Al Baldus quite well, and uh, when he was in the U.S. House of Representatives in the late 1970s, that's when I started working in the U.S. House, and so I got to know him then, and then in the 1980s, I also worked in the House, and of course, Al was defeated in the, in the Reagan landslide of 1980, but when I moved to Wisconsin in 1988 to take a job with the Democratic State Senate Majority Leader, the next year, Al ran in a special election uh, to replace uh, Jim Harsdorf, who had, wrought, had become the Secretary of uh, Agriculture in the Thompson administration. And, and Al wasn't, was very happy being a member of the Assembly, but uh, said he would do it. And uh, so I came up here and had an opportunity. I didn't come here, actually. I went to, uh, I went to Polk County with, with Al. We went to Clear Lake, uh, the home of Gaylord Nelson, and I did doors there. But I just remember what a kind, nice gentleman he was, what a great, decent human being. He was a, a legislator who never let power uh, affect the way he was as a person. And I just always thought one of the finest people that I'd ever met in public service. And so it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, unfortunately, Al's no longer with us, but uh, I wanted to pay tribute to him. Um, also, um, I, again, I've always heard great things about Menominee. And uh, as I drove through tonight, quickly to get over here, uh, you, you truly do have a beautiful town. And how exciting it is that a new uh, League of Women Voters uh, chapter has been reborn here. And one of the exciting things, if you can ever, if you can think of any of the good that has come out of the last uh, eight months, uh, one of the very positive uh, elements, and this is happening all over the state, is that leagues of women voter chapters are starting not just here but in several other places around the state. Uh, common Cause membership has grown. <coughs> what I'm particularly excited about is the fact that there are people in their 20s and 30s who were so shocked in many ways by the outcome of Wisconsin's election in November that they have been motivated to join and become part of movements like this. And a lot of those people look to people of Andrea's and my vintage, 
and say, well, what can we do that would make a difference? And one of the things that's really resonated is changing the partisan gerrymandering system uh, in Wisconsin, which, by the way, uh, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, is, is amongst the worst in the country at the moment. Uh, the other thing before I get into the meat of the, the talk is I wanted to just, again, thank Kets very much and, uh, and Margie and all the folks that I had an opportunity to meet with before who were forming the, the organizing committee of, of the league. Uh, uh, you're in good hands from uh, meeting them, and I think this is going to be a very, very vibrant uh, addition to the reform community in the state. Um, I also wanted to note that my my friend and former colleague in arms, uh, former Representative Jeff Smith of Eau Claire, is here tonight. Uh, Jeff was the chair of the Assembly Committee on Elections and Campaigns during a critical period not so long ago, from 2007 to 2010, when tremendous reform occurred in this state that has all since been repealed and destroyed by Governor Walker and the folks in charge since that time. But Jeff was the chair of the committee that reported out two great reforms, uh, the Government Accountability uh, Board establishment, the nonpartisan Government Accountability Board, which was highly effective in the state, which was a model for the nation on overseeing elections, ethics, campaign finance, and lobby law in the nation. We were the model. We were the best. And that was destroyed in 2015 uh, and made into a partisan, weak imitation of what it used to be. And the other uh, great reform that Jeff Smith helped steer through and marshal through the legislature was passage of the impartial justice law and that was in 2009 and it was only in place for less than a year and a half it established full 100 percent public financing for candidates for the wisconsin supreme court who agreed to spending limits and it made sense on every level because the campaigns were only supposed to cost about a maximum four hundred thousand dollars a piece the candidate for the supreme court couldn't accept any money that might influence his or her decision as they sat on the bench. And it was the perfect thing that Wisconsin needed to reestablish confidence in the judiciary. That was repealed in one of the first, in the budget of 2011, destroyed. And we now have what is considered to be amongst the most partisan, polarizing, and I would argue corrupt Supreme Courts of any state in the country. Uh, so anyway. Thanks to Jeff for his service, he now works uh, for Citizen Action and is organizing in this part of the state, and uh, he is an incredibly valuable person to get to know uh, and to work with. Redistricting, Gary Manning. You know, I've been with Common Cause for 22 years, and when I talked about this issue in, uh, oh, I don't know, say 10 years ago, uh, I would look at one side of the room and quickly see eyes begin to glaze. <laughs> the other side, people would sort of, you know, lapse into a, in a semi-coma as we talked about this process. <laughs> and now it is really one of the hot issues, uh, not just in Wisconsin, but in the nation, because it is so critical and so important, and it is really sort of, in many ways, the, the root determinant of our politics and our public policy. And in Wisconsin in particular, uh, you, you need to understand what has happened in this state and what's happened over time and how we got to where we are now. The reason you have to understand that is that part of that is to undo that process to get to where we need to be. And for many years in Wisconsin, after the census, now you all know that after every 10 years there's a national census and each state is required to count their people or the national, the federal government is, and then the state legislative and congressional districts have to be by law redrawn in order to reflect the shifts in population. And it is done by usually partisan politicians, but usually it had always been done in most places. Illinois might be an exception. There's a couple others over the years. But most places it was done in a fairly even-handed manner where Republicans and Democrats would come together and they would work out some kind of compromise. That was the case for many years in Wisconsin. In fact, for five redistricting processes prior to 2011, that was the case. And it was in large part because 
government was divided, where there was either a Republican or Democrat as the governor, or one house or the other was in the hands of one party or the other. So compromise was essential to, cut, to fashion uh, redistricting and to fashion legislative districts so that no one party had a huge advantage over the other. And that was the case through the 2011, or through the 20, uh, 2001 process. But then in 2010, you'll recall, something of a tsunami hit not just Wisconsin, but the country. And Republicans swept to power in all the states of the upper Midwest, including Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, a number of other states around the country. And Republicans actually decided to put into effect a plan that they had developed years before. And we know this because uh, the, the, the blueprints were out there and people could see what they were wanting to do. And what they did in Wisconsin was they redrew the state legislative district lines in such a way that they were determined that they would have permanent political power in the legislature. They did that by basically packing as many Democrats in Democratic areas like Dane County, where I'm from, or Milwaukee County, some other places around the state, small pockets, into those Democratic areas and making them essentially safe Democratic seats. But they also made more Republican seats, more seats competitive, and seats that Democrats like Jeff Smith that had formerly been very competitive into, into seats that had a Republican advantage and a decided Republican advantage. So in that manner, they were able to uh, put into effect and keep the changes that they had won in the election of 2010. And so what happened is that, in, this was happening all around the country, but in Wisconsin, it was considered to be the most severe, the most partisan Republican gerrymander of any gerrymander in the country in 2011, and one of the five most partisan gerrymanders in the last 50 years anywhere in the United States. And so essentially, they made this state, at least for the next 10 years, pretty safe in terms, or they thought so, in terms of how the, they would be able to control both houses of the legislature. And uh, we know that this was effective because in the 2012 uh, elections, where President Obama, the Democrat, <coughs> carried the state overwhelmingly, it also was true that 52% of Wisconsinites voted for Democrats for the legislature, but only 39 of the 99 seats in the Wisconsin Assembly had Democratic representatives after the 2012 election. That number has since fallen from 39 to, what is it, 36 now, if I'm not mistaken, or 35. I think it's, I think it's 64 Republicans or 63 Republicans, 36 Democrats. That is a result of the gerrymander system. Again, the reason we know that is because there are now fewer than 10% of the 99 assembly seats, fewer than 10%, nine seats, are arguably in any way remotely competitive. And by competitive, I'm talking about 55% to 45% or less. And as Jeff can tell you, even a 55% to 45% victory is considered a substantial victory uh, by any measure. But that's the parameters that we consider competitive. And so that means that 90 of the 99 assembly districts in this state had uh, a phone call. <laughs> 90 of the 99 uh, assembly districts in this state did not have competitive elections. So you all were robbed, or most people were robbed, of a genuine choice in the general election. Instead, what happened was that if there was any competition in an assembly district, it might be in the primary. And there was a systematic approach to that too, particularly with our friends on the Republican side. Because what they determined was, in a primary election, usually the more conservative of the Republicans are the folks that turn out. And so anyone that was sort of a moderate, uh, a person like Senator Dale Schultz of Richland Center, for instance, 
a moderate Republican. A Republican, to be sure, a conservative, yes, but he was not a far right-wing Republican. Well, he was threatened with a primary by a more conservative candidate, an assembly person by the name of Howard Markline, who was going to be funded $100,000 from Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce to run against Dale Schultz. So people like Dale Schultz opted out not to run again. Another person that I worked with for many years, Senator Michael Ellis of Nina, an irascible, some would say unpleasant, uh, but very independent-minded Republican from Nina, also was facing that problem and was actually ambushed by a conservative Republican group who caught him at a bar uh, after a couple of drinks making some statements that he deeply regretted. And he also would have been threatened with a primary. So the moderates in the Republican Party have been thrust out. There's been a purge in the Democratic Party, too, to some degree. There were some moderates in Milwaukee who in 2012, Peggy Krusik was one. There, there were several others. But that's because, in part, because the action, the real election, was in the primary. It wasn't in the general election in so many of these districts anymore. So as a result, uh, the Republicans have controlled the process uh, and have controlled the legislature. And unless something happens, like changing the voting districts by full order in the next year or so, uh, it's possible that they will maintain control until the end, till the next census in 2020. Now, uh, this was happening, again, not just in Wisconsin, all over the country. There are examples in democratic states where this has happened. Uh, Rhode Island and Maryland are two egregious examples where the Democrats have done the exact same thing. And God knows in Illinois, uh, the Democrats will never allow the Republicans to have control in the Illinois General Assembly. They have a speaker by the name of Michael Madigan, who's been the speaker, I think, since about the mid or early 1980s. He's known as Speaker for Life down there. Because they do the same thing. They gerrymander the districts, and they make sure that their political power, their party, stays in power. So that's the problem. What's the solution? Well, the solution in Wisconsin, and there are a number of ways that you could approach this. Some states like California have independent citizen commissions where the legislature and the politicians are all taken out of the equation entirely, and you'll have a group of citizens who are chosen through some very convoluted but uh, specific procedure to sit on a commission, and those are the people that decide how the lines should be drawn. We as reformers have always preferred the system that they have to our neighbor to the west, Iowa. And in Iowa, the system is not taken out of the hands of the legislature completely. And the reason for that is that in order to do that, and in order to establish a citizens commission, we'd have to have two, we'd have to do an extra extremely difficult thing to do. We would have to amend the Wisconsin Constitution. Because the Wisconsin Constitution specifically says the legislature shall draw or have jurisdiction over the legislative and congressional boundaries. And so in order to do that in Wisconsin, it's very difficult to get through the legislature an amendment saying you no longer have the power to draw the district lines. And you'd have to do that not one session of the legislature, but two sessions of the legislature, two consecutive. So it became almost impossible for us to imagine a scenario where we could have an independent citizens commission. But the way Iowa does it is pretty good. What they do is they have a state entity called the Legislative Services Bureau, which is a state employee, they're nonpartisan, civil service protected state employees who draw the district lines after every census. They do it without any interference or any input from any legislator. They do it according to a set of very strict criteria. Amongst them are keep towns and cities together to the extent possible. Keep counties together to the extent possible. In Wisconsin, 48 of the 72 counties are split amongst several legislative districts. The other thing they say in Iowa is that squares are good. 
Rectangles are nice. <laughs> not lizards. Not snakes. Not winding little, you know, appendages. Uh, and we have some of those in Wisconsin. We have a district to the south of southeast of Milwaukee that's shaped like a gun pointed at Milwaukee. That's the shape of the district. And so what's happened in Wisconsin is that you have towns like Beloit. You have Monroe County, which is not a large county. It's all it's fairly close to here. It's divided amongst two congressional, two members of Congress. It's divided amongst three members of the assembly. So the communities of interest are not kept intact at all in Wisconsin. In Iowa, they're required to do so. And so the result in Iowa, and by the way, the Iowa system was adopted by a Republican governor and a Republican legislature in 1980. Why? Because they wanted to have a system that would save taxpayers money. In Iowa, previous to that, the redistricting process had gone to court and those fees added up. We know that because in Wisconsin, you all have forked over $2.2 million to defend hyper-partisan redistricting uh, maps for the Republicans. In Iowa, the only additional cost to the taxpayers is they rent two vans that go around and take the Legislative Services Bureau to three mandated public hearings around the state. So the extra cost is about $640 every 10 years. Compared to Wisconsin, 2.2 million. And as you may know, uh, Scott Fitzgerald, the Senate Majority Leader, and Robin Boss, the Republican Assembly Speaker, have just authorized your tax dollars to pay for two additional law firms to defend these maps before the United States Supreme Court. One, $175,000 to draw, to, to do one amicus brief by the former Solicitor General of the United States. And then another is a Wisconsin law firm where the former Attorney General, J.B. Van Hollen, and his press secretary are principals. They will be paid $300 an hour with no cap to be able to assist in the defense of these indefensible maps. So Iowa did it because they wanted to save the taxpayers money. There's no such consideration here in Wisconsin. So what you had is, as I said, the most partisan Republican gerrymander in the country. Again, there have been partisan Democratic gerrymanders. The one issue that people have always thought is that if districts can be ordered to be redrawn by courts, and the United States Supreme Court in particular, because of irregularities in the way they racially are, com are, are composed, and that's true. The courts have regularly ordered in North Carolina, other states, even in Wisconsin, in 2011, there were two Latino districts in Wisconsin, and they were ordered to be redrawn because it was a violation of voting rights law. And, the, and the, uh, not the Supreme Court, but a federal court ordered them to be redrawn. But the one question that has always been is, can a district be too excessively partisan? Can it, in effect, disenfranchise voters who are voting for one party and in effect never have the opportunity to see the candidate that they're voting for either win or the candidate of that party and seeing that party ever in control of the legislature. And it turns out that one of the conservative Supreme Court justices uh, on the U.S. Supreme Court, Anthony Kennedy, uh, said he was open in 2004 to exactly such a standard because it was his view that yes, if you can count disenfranchisement because people, because of their race, then certainly it stands to reason that people can be disenfranchised because they vote for a particular candidate of a particular party. But he said what has to happen is you need to come up with a standard to show me, to show us, the court, that people are disenfranchised and that they are not able to have an equal voice with the people who are voting for the majority party. And so in 2015, two summers ago, uh, a group of individuals and very smart attorneys uh, got together and they sat down and they said, let's devise this standard. And Wisconsin, as it turns out, uh, was the perfect uh, vehicle by which to advance it. 
And what they have drawn up, it's a case called Whitford v. Gill, G-I-L-L. -L. It's currently before the United States Supreme Court. We think they're going to take it. We think perhaps they're likely to act on it. And what it really says is that people in Wisconsin have been effectively disenfranchised. And part of it is the whole process by which the maps were drawn. You know, in 2011, and, and certainly uh, Jeff knows this very well, and Andrea does too, when the Republicans drew the maps, they did it in such a way that it was kept entirely secret from the public. It was kept entirely secret from the minority party. It was even kept entirely secret from members of the Republican Party until the Republicans came over to the Michael Best and Friedrich Law Office, which, by the way, is full of people that go back and forth between Republican administrations and that law firm. A fellow by the name of Ray Tafora has held jobs with Governor Thompson, Governor Walker, Michael Best and Friedrich. He goes back and forth like a ping pong ball. But this law firm drew the maps in secret with Republican staffers and made Republican legislators come over and sign actual oaths of secrecy to say that they would not detail, give any details about that. That actually has become part of the litigation process. Possible violation of open records laws and open meetings laws. And there's a whole, there's a number of other elements in this law case that have really pushed the chances for this to be successful <coughs> forward. But the process was unbelievable. And as I say, very costly to taxpayers. So the Whitford Gill lawsuit I'm not going to go into all the minutia about it, but, but the basic tenet of it is that it is, we have effectively in Wisconsin disenfranchised many voters because if they vote for a particular party, they have no hope that their party will ever control either house of the Wisconsin legislature. And we think, and certainly the plaintiffs, feel very good about the chances of that appealing to uh, Justice Kennedy. And by the way, Justice Neil Gorsuch, who was just named the Supreme Court, we already know he would not vote for this, but he's replacing Justice Anthony Scalia, who we already knew wasn't going to vote for this. It's Justice Kennedy who's the key, because the four non-conservatives and Justice Kennedy would compose the 5-4 majority that would vote in favor of the Whitford Gill uh, appeal to the United States Supreme Court. Now, there's another scenario where the United States Supreme Court might say, well, we don't really want to get too involved in women. If that's the case, then the federal court in Wisconsin decision stands. And in November, the three-judge panel in federal court in Wisconsin found the 2011 district lines unconstitutional. And they, in January, ordered the Wisconsin legislature to redraw the district lines by November 1st of this year, in time, obviously, for the 2018 elections. Now, if that were to be the case, it wouldn't be nearly as sweeping as if they rule in favor of Whitford, because if they rule in favor of Whitford, that would overturn the gerrymanders of not just Wisconsin, but Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Maryland, Republican and Democratic gerrymanders where people have been effectively disenfranchised across the country. But if they decide not to take the case, then the federal court decision stands. And that would still be a good thing for Wisconsin because the, the, the district lines would have to be redrawn. And that court order still stands. And where we are right now is the Attorney General, Brad Schimmel, has put all his eggs in the basket of betting that the United States Supreme Court will do as they have done in the past and which they argue, the Republicans have argued, should be done because it's always been done that way. Oh, those are just politicians doing what politicians do. Partisans always draw lines to advantage their political party. You can't suddenly change the rules after doing this for 200 years this way. Well, I think they said maybe the same thing about women not voting. I think they said the same thing about slavery. I mean, you know, it, it, there comes a time in history when 
when things need to be changed because they, re they reach a critical mass. And there's no question that the gerrymandering that was done in the United States in 2011 is unlike the extreme partisanship gerrymandering that we've ever seen in this country. It's never been to this access and to this degree. So here's the exciting thing. The exciting thing is the court case. The exciting thing is that folks like you, this many, I mean, I used to, I was telling someone, I, went, I once went up to northern Wisconsin and spoke to three people on gerrymandering. <laughs> there is so much more interest in it now, which is incredible. There's so much more interest in the part of young citizens now because they understand, you know, they, understand, they, get, they get the power thing. They understand elections. They also understand that when and if they do vote, which is sometimes an effort, but increasingly I think it's going to be easier if we organize, that their vote may not matter as much if we have a gerrymandered system in the legislature and in Congress. When I moved to Wisconsin, six of the nine, there were then nine congressional districts, were competitive. Now, zero today. Not a single congressional district is remotely competitive. The Fox Valley seat, uh, Green Bay, Appleton, was thought to be, it turns out it's not, so there are no competitive districts. And you know what they did in this part of the state. Uh, they made the third congressional district, Brian Kind, and the seventh congressional district, which used to be Dave Obey, those were both kind of robust. I mean, Obey always won because he was there for many years. But, you know, it was still considered a, com a competitive district. And Kind, of course, had some had tough runs. It had been re represented by Steve Gunderson, a Republican and before him, my friend Al Baldus, but it was somewhat competitive, and you know what they did? They took Portage County, a Democratic stronghold, out of the seventh and gave it to Ron Kind so that the third congressional district is essentially a safe Democratic district, and now the seventh has been made pretty safe for Sean Duffy. That's not to say that you can't field candidates who can't run vigorous campaigns and possibly upset these people but it just makes it a lot more difficult. So the, the Whitford lawsuit doesn't affect the congressional seats. It's, it's designed and aimed solely at the legislative. It's the assembly districts and by, by extension state senate because each state senate district is three assembly districts. So that's where the action is. The Iowa model, here's the good thing about that. Everybody's united behind it except for one legislator that Jeff Smith and I have talked about. And, uh, so essentially everybody's united. All the reform groups are united behind it. And there's unanimity in thought and in pushing this legislation. And one of the remarkable things that I saw in the months after Trump's election were we went and talked to several groups. I talked to a group called uh, Organizing for America and another group called Indivisible. And those groups mobilized three, five, seven hundred calls and letters into the Capitol in support of the Iowa reforms. What they particularly did, and what my members did, and I know League members did, was when Fitzgerald and Voss announced that they were going to bill us, the taxpayers, for legal fees. Instead of fixing potholes or you know financing schools, they were going to use that money to pay Washington, D.C. lawyers or lawyers from, uh, from uh, J.B. Van Hollen's law firm, we got lots of calls and, and communications into the Capitol. And we specifically asked people to call Boston Fitzgerald's office. It drove them nuts. We know that. They were angry. But what Boss did, and what, Fair, well, what Fitzgerald did too, was they said, okay, we'll cap the fees at 175000 for the out-of-state law firm. They also named the law firm sooner than they were willing to do. So these are small things. But it, it, but it shows you what citizen pressure can do. And if enough people are mobilized, you can make a difference. We also know that there's only one Republican in the legislature who has signed on to the Iowa model. It's been introduced by, in the Senate by Senator Dave Hanson of Green Bay, a Democrat. Uh, and in the assembly by Senator Don, or assembly person Don uh, Ruwick of Milton, new guy. The freshmen are always uh, in the assembly, the folks that are 
given the redistricting uh, uh, challenge. Uh, but uh, we have one Republican, Todd Novak of Dodgeville. And we know there's other Republicans who are supported, but there is such tremendous pressure on the part of Fitzgerald and Boss to protect this because it is such a source of their power. And they have failed year after year to even allow a public hearing. Finally, last year, in 2016, we were able to force through the Wisconsin State Journal, Kathy Bernier, who represents Chippewa Falls, is the chair, the Republican chair of the Campaign and Elections Committee, the, the chair that I wish Jeff were chairing. And uh, she finally relented to a public hearing, but kind of. She did it on April 1st, April Fool's Day. And she had invited guests only. Andrea Kaminsky and I both testified. And she brought in somebody from Mississippi uh, to tell everyone why nonpartisan redistricting was a bad idea. So it, but nevertheless, she responded to pressure. That's how they'll own, that's the only way they respond. You know that and I know that. If you want anything done through the legislature or in Congress, it takes public pressure and it takes citizens' pressure. And so that's why I'm delighted to see so many of you here tonight interested in this issue. And I will tell you that, you know, your state representative and your state senator, and let me let me address Sheila Harsdorf for a moment. I have been with Common Cause for twenty two years. When I came here, Alice Clausing was her state senator, and then Sheila defeated Alice in 2000. And I went to see Klaus, I mean to Harsdorf, and she was very supportive of the idea of nonpartisan redistricting reform. She co-sponsored with Dave Hansen the Iowa bill, the very bill we're talking about today. She was a supporter of public financing for election campaigns, public financing. She was a strong supporter of disclosure. She was not for voter suppression. What's happened over the years, of course, is that the Republican leadership has put pressure on her and she has folded. And she has sort of dropped those <coughs> positions. But we do think that if it came to a critical vote in the Senate or in the Assembly, that there are some people that we could conceivably pick off a few Republicans, maybe more and more, if they if they hear enough pressure from their constituents to do so, uh, to do the right thing. And that's why we don't give up, because you've got to constantly go after these people, and citizens, constituents have to constantly remind their elected representatives about these issues and how you feel about them, even if they don't uh, side with you. And I hear, hear often people saying, Oh, my voice won't matter, they never respond, they don't agree. Well, you know, by law they're required to keep track of the people who contact them. And we know through open records uh, disclosures, for instance, that some legislators received two or three hundred calls in favor of keeping the nonpartisan government accountability board intact. Zero calls to eliminate it and yet they voted to eliminate it because their leadership told them. That record we want to establish as well for things like nonpartisan redistricting reform or repeal of voter photo ID when you come to that struggle, <coughs> reestablishing public financing, for reestablishing openness in government and transparency in our election laws. I mean, there's a whole host of things that I feel like I'll be going back to 1978 to start working on again, because these are the reforms that we had back then that have all been eliminated over the last 30 years. But these are dogged fights, and we have to stay in the fight. And uh, believe it or not, I am optimistic about the future. Um, and, and so with that, I just want to end my remarks, because I, I assume that you have plenty of questions. And I want you to direct your questions, not just to me, but to Andrea, and certainly Jeff Miller, who's here as well as an expert in these issues. So if you have any questions at all, please, uh, or disagreements or, or whatever, please don't hesitate. And thank you very much for inviting me. Now, I would encourage you, if you have a question, to raise, uh, and there's some, and we'll address them to either of you, or both of you. Or come. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
take them over there and we'll start with this one. Are there League of Women Voter um, policy statements that can be found and where? Thank you for that question. Um, on our website, which I'm going to write up there, it is LWV, like voter, WI dot ORG. Um, it's also on this little thing here, this uh, card. You can, you can find all of our policy statements, our state policy statements, and links that go into our, our national uh, policy statements. Um, I, as I said, these statements have been written over 97 years, and um, they're very detailed and very, uh, very well thought out. You can also join on the, uh, on the website, something I should have mentioned before. Another question is, is there a best way to contact our legislators? Jeff, what's the answer? Telephone calls. <laughs> <laughs> Telephone calls to their Madison office generally, or, or their home district office. But what's good about that, and Jeff can tell you, is that sometimes you'll get the rep themselves. But you'll, get, you'll usually get a fairly polite staffer. Of course, what they always try to determine is whether you're from the district or not. But you know what? Even if you're not, go on and state your business anyway, especially to the leadership. Because you know the decisions of Boss and Fitzgerald have tremendous influence over everybody in the state. So you're just as entitled to talk to them as all. Well. But phone calls, yes. Letters, believe it or not, effective because they're so rare. Like actually a hand-typed letter, not the FBI, a royal typewriter. But, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, a letter as opposed to some form. Email's good too. I mean, when in doubt, if you don't have time to do anything else, I do an email. But phone calls, and, and by the way, personal visits. Organizing a personal visit of five or six people to go in and talk to somebody <coughs> is powerful. It really is. Very powerful. You know, I, I think that's right. If you um, if you just send an email, they're, they, as they get it, they're trying to think of which form letter to send back in some cases. If they have a phone call, they've got to stop and talk to you. And in some cases, if you're not part of that district, if you're not part of their district, they don't always want to respond. Would you say that? Yes, but as, as, um, as Jay mentioned, they're all they're all serving Wisconsin, and if they are in a leadership position, such as Representative Boss or, or Senator Fitzgerald, if they're the chair of a committee, I think they and it's, they have a responsibility to listen to you. If the districts are redrawn, why should we expect the new districts to be any better? Well, well that's the great question. Um, so. With this court case, one of the things the federal judge said when the districts have to be redrawn in 2017 was that they are subject first to the approval of the federal court. So, and, and, what, and, much, and what of what he said in his opinion, or what they said in their opinion, their majority opinion, was that the process by which they were drawn in 2011 is unacceptable. The secrecy, the lack of transparency, the secrecy oaths, the shutting out of the public, the shutting out of the uh, minority party from even seeing the maps, that process cannot continue. So there are criteria which I think they're either in the process, and again maybe Jeff might know more details about this, but which they're either in the process of formulating or, or expanding upon. But it can't be done in the same way. Now, unfortunately, um, or fortunately if you're a Republican, I guess, but the, but the Republicans will still be in control of the process during the redrawing of the districts in 2017. One of the things we've urged is that, boy, wouldn't this be an ideal time to adopt the Iowa system, where you'd have not them in charge of it, but have the nonpartisan Legislative Reference Bureau doing the drawing of the maps for 2017 for the 2018 elections. So that's one of the reasons we're pushing hard for Iowa to be taken up and enacted into law this year. It's not to say that Boston Fitzgerald are going to have any of that. They're likely 
I'm not going to pay any attention to it. But that would be the case. Now, if the United States Supreme Court orders the, um, declares Wisconsin unconstitutional and all the other states in the country, then that will be even a bigger uh, push for Iowa because there will be, uh, across the country, a set of uh, rules that will be coming promulgated uh, by other states as well about how to do how to do this in a nonpartisan manner. So, but you're right. I mean, the only thing that will change is elections. The elections will change the result, and we're not going to get that change unless we have a change in the election. One other thing about redistricting that, and, and again, Jeff would know this, is that you are redistricting when the, when the lines are drawn in 2011. They don't always stay as partisan Republican or partisan Democrat over time because people move. Population shift, and some of the districts that were ultra uh, Republican might be less so because of certain populations moving in or out, and vice versa. So sometimes that will create an election, you know, some elections where the results would be surprising and, and might change, which has nothing to do with. Uh, the way they were drawn eight or nine years before. Okay, uh, does the implementing the Iowa system mean um, not mean a change in our state constitution? Does it mean? That's correct. That's correct because in the, the Iowa uh, state constitution has the same provision giving the responsibility for uh, redistricting to the legislature. That's why they they um, delegate it to a legislative agency. So it, there, the legislature still has the, the ultimate approval, uh, the final approval on the maps, but it's drawn uh, by, by a, a nonpartisan agency. Yeah, and just let me add, the, the legislature cannot amend the maps that are put forward by the Legislative Reference Bureau. In other words, the, the LRB presents the maps, it's an up or down vote, yes or no. And in Iowa, the way it's worked is that People are, legislators are in such fear of being accused of being overly partisan because they would, because the newspaper editorials and the whole state would rain down on them for, for, for trying to unfair, get unfair advantage to become the culture there. I don't know if the culture would stick right away in Wisconsin, but it might, it, might, it would over time. And the point is that there can't, it's an up or down vote, and in Iowa it's always gone through if not on the first vote, in the second vote of the legislature. How do we get younger people involved? <laughs> we have to bring this message to, to, to them. We also have to listen to them and find out what their interests are. I think young people are very concerned that things be fair. Um, and they, they expect elections to be fair. What we have right now is a system that doesn't um, appeal to, it, or it doesn't pr provide, it doesn't produce um, a legislative body that represents the will of the people. And um, I think that's, that's a strong message to bring to young people. And um, we have to engage them and include them at every possible turn. Uh, Common Cause has held a lot of public forums on this and always on college campuses. And uh, we've done some with kids as well. I, I just want to add, uh, Donald Trump's helped tremendously. Yeah. <laughs> and, and by the way, a decision he made today will help tremendously. Yeah. Because I don't know of anybody under the age of 30 that doesn't think that climate change and global warming is not real. And it's their future, after all, they're going to have to live in. So it's our job to say, look, if you don't like what just happened, you need to become involved. And here's a way to do it. Here's where you can make a difference. That's how you get you connect for people. The greater scare, the problem, the, 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 the future, with what you can do specifically to change the climate now. Gerrymander reform is one. I want to add just one other thing. Everybody in this room has within their power to find 10 to 20 people that are not prepared to vote. They think they're prepared to vote. It might be an elderly person who doesn't drive any more. more. It might be somebody that lives and relies on public transportation. But you know, Trump won this state by 23,000 votes. The voter turnout in Wisconsin 
between 2012 and 2016 was sharper, the drop-off was sharper than in any other state in the country except for Mississippi. And that is in large part because of the voter ID law. People were turned away at the polls. Now, that's the law. We have to comply with it. But what we can do is make sure people have that ID. So there are specific things that you can do. And one of the things we're trying to do on college campuses, and we want to get uh, legislation introduced, which may not go anywhere, but draw public attention to, is that you can use a, U a University of Wisconsin ID on some <coughs> campuses to vote. But on some other UW campuses, you can't use it. There's no uniformity. There's no, there's no system. And they require that you have to get an ID at a University of Wisconsin or public institution that has a two-year expiration date. How many students are going to take the time to get a new ID to vote amongst all the other things they do? You should be able to have one ID with your picture on it, period and be able to vote at any public or private college in the country. But those are the types of things that we can do. That's how we get young people involved. And college students, by the way, are angry about this and when they're turned away at the polls and they can't vote. So that's what we can do is, is try to uh, push, push those types of things. This is someone that said, I lived in Iowa from 1976 until 1983 and worked on two can worked every on campaigns every two years in several districts and on statewide elections, especially in 1980. I can confirm that in 1980 and 82 the districts were competitive. Wow. So that's that's something. Wasn't making it up. Right, and there's two others that deal with Iowa. Um, let's see where are they? What specific tactics do you recommend to have? The important uh, to have the important impact in advancing a nonpartisan change like Iowa model, and I'm also going to read this one. Does the Iowa model have weaknesses that can be exploited by partisans? What protects it? Well, yes, it does have weaknesses because uh, in Iowa, after three votes in the in the Iowa legislature, if they don't vote for the maps then the nonpartisan entity is no longer part of the process and the partisans come in and they can draw the maps. There is such an onus on that to happen though. There is such great fear on the part of either Republicans or Democrats. You know, they have an extreme right wing, maybe the most right wing conservative Republican member of the U.S. House guy by the name of Steve King, who represents the North, Northeast King of, uh, of Iowa. He supports the Iowa plan, as well as Tom Harkin and any of the most progressive Democrats in the state. The reason they support the Iowa plan is because the people support it, and they demand it, and the people are very suspicious of any politician who tries to speak against it. So that's what you do. You, build, you have to build the culture and the public trust, and you have to build this thing up and make sure. But sure, there's, there, we're a democracy, so there are weaknesses in anything that we do. The other thing I should just tell you about Iowa is it doesn't mandate into law uh, competitive to competitiveness. It mandates simply the criteria by which you draw the lines, and as a result of that criteria, competitiveness flows naturally out of it. But they don't say, like uh, there's a certain member of the Wisconsin legislature who would want to mandate into law that every assembly district be competitive. But to do that, you would have not just gerrymandered salamanders and snakes. You would have, you know, you'd have highways being the only device, connection between communities. It would look, it would look amazingly unnatural and atrocious. So yeah, Iowa does have some flaws. Every system does. But I can tell you, it's a lot better than the system we have now. Do you need that idea? No, well, it's just the other thing is that the Iowa plan is the practical one. As, as Jay said, um, we don't have to amend our Constitution. Um, that's something that could be passed. It could be passed this year and probably become should law. be and become law. But it's going to take a lot of pressure to get there. <laughs> well, that relates to the next question. What action can we take regarding the legislation to adopt the Iowa system. Are there scripts, talking points, 
what is the timeline? And also, which is related, is the timing of putting pressure on representatives on particular, is there a timeline for putting pressure on representatives on particular issues? For instance, right before the vote. Well, I, I think the time is any time. And, and All the many time. times. And over and over again in different ways. <laughs> Um, and, and that means not only contacting your, your legislators, but also um, writing letters to the editor. Also, just talking to people and getting them to contact their legislators. Um, and I would just recommend that you get on the, the mailing list of it. We both, we have both have email uh, lists that we, you know, that we send out. Um, I call it my more or less weekly e-news that, um, we will let you know when a vote is coming up. We will let you know when there's something out there. We can, uh, we'll provide talking points. Um, we'll let you know when, when something is in the news that's related and you can, you can use that as your, your news peg. Um, and I, I think you can do, uh, for the league, you can sign up for our, our e-news. It's free. Uh, just go to our website and Jay. And the only thing I'll add is that, you know, every newspaper editorial board in the state is on our side. Yeah. And three years ago when we started this, we were able to coordinate simultaneous Sundays where every newspaper editorial board, including the Chippewa Herald, by the way, would run editorials in support of the Iowa Plan nonpartisan uh, reform. And I'm, I'm going to talk to Scott Melford, who's the editorial uh, page editor of the Wisconsin State Journal, and David Haynes, who's the same position with the Milwaukee Sentinel. Journal Sentinel, and they've been coordinating this with the Gannett papers, and we're going to try to start that again this summer, where we'll have simultaneous editorials going out across the state. So when the when your legislator reads, the, now they don't pay, they say they don't pay attention to it, but when they read those and then they hear pressure from their constituents, and then one other thing that we're going to try to do, certainly for the 2018 elections, which we were successful on some newspapers, is making one of the criteria for endorsing a legislative candidate, their support for nonpartisan redistricting reform. And I've reasoned to the newspapers, if you're gonna support this, why would you endorse a candidate who doesn't support it? If you think it's important for democracy, why would you endorse somebody who doesn't think it's important? So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Okay, yes, yeah. Yeah. okay couple, just a couple things. Um, pressure, pressure on, we have the chair, as has been mentioned, right here in the Chippewa Valley, the chair of, of the uh, committee that has this in her file right now. And she has refused to um, have a hearing this, this session. She had a hearing, a private hearing before. But we want a public hearing. So here, right here in the Chippewa Valley, we have some power. We can put pressure. So this is the warm-up. You've just been educated, and now you should bring people who need also to be educated to the next forum on the 22nd. And we're going to continue to build that momentum, which we are building across the state for this movement. And like Jay said, he could only get three people at one time, and now we got 77 or 78 people here tonight. I think that's marvelous. Thank you to the leader who ever voted. Um, this is a, I, we have a, <laughs> this is a, uh, I have a couple questions, still questions left. left. Um, what communities are involved in the greater Chippewa Valley chapter? And I, I kind of went through, and you might want to answer this too. We're looking at, it's greater Chippewa Valley, not just Dunn County. So we're looking at Dunn County, Eau Claire County, Barron County, Chippewa County, uh, St. Croix County, uh, Pepin County and Polk, Polk County, but Polk doesn't, there, isn't there something going on on uh, some kind of group in Polk? Okay, so we're looking at the whole region in saying we need to work together and instead of everybody developing their own area, if we work together we are stronger in numbers. So, um, so that would be the reason, so you'd be joining the state league, uh, but you'd be part of the Chippewa Valley um, the greater Chippewa Valley. The greater Chippewa Valley. <laughs> Same prayer, too. You're the greatest. Um, do you want to say anything more on that? No, that's fine. Okay. Um, Try to get somebody in Lake Halley. That's where Berger's from. Uh, <laughs> anybody from that district? <laughs> All right. Good. 
Would you explain the math around the Supreme Court case showing the disenchant dis disenchantment? Disenfranchisement. Okay, I'm going to turn that to you. What's the, the math? The math of the court. Around well, who asked the question? So we yeah, maybe clarify. Who asked the question? Are you wanting to clarify? So, are you are they looking at you know the different um, the standard? The justice, I would, the I would assume it's the number of justices well, and who would fall on which who side. Fall on well, it's side. It, well, yeah. five four is what we're looking at. And, uh, so it's the, so the four that we know would be the four that we know that would be supportive are Justice Breyer, Justice Sotomayor, uh, Justice Ginsburg, and, um, and Justice Kagan, and then Justice Anthony Kennedy would be the conservative, and that, that they would join those, and then the four Thomas. Uh, Roberts, Alito, and uh, Gorsuch would be the Justice Kennedy is key. He's the key. He's the person. Yes. I'll bet. I'll bet the math that was being referred to yes. because I have seen an article on this from time to time. Thank you for coming. Has to do with with what Justice Kennedy was looking for. Right. The standard. Of the standard. standard. Yeah. Of standard right. formula. Yeah. It, well, it, yeah. well, without going into too much detail, it's a it's a mathematical formulation of what's called wasted votes. And it's people that live in a district where they might be voting for a Democratic candidate, but the di but the district has been gerrymandered in such a way that it's the the Republican will always win that district. Their vote is worth less than the someone voting Republican, and so it's a calculation of the number of districts where those those situations exist, and those are called wasted votes. And they come up with it's a, it's a formulaic uh, number, but it's turned out that that number accurately can predict sort of what what's going to happen. And so they've applied that to Wisconsin, but they're also going to see they're also trying to apply that to say Rhode Island and Maryland. And by the way, there is a Democratic case. One one the original plan of this was to try to have a Republican gerrymander and a Democratic gerrymander. Wisconsin and Rhode Island, or Wisconsin and Maryland, come up at the same time. But the Wisconsin folks did such a great job in getting their thing through the federal courts, and the uh, the uh, the Iowa or the uh, uh, the Maryland and the Rhode Island folks didn't. So that's the case that's before the Supreme Court. But nevertheless, if it, the Supreme Court finds in favor of the Wisconsin plaintiffs, that would apply to democratically gerrymandered states as well. Dunn County has passed a resolution regarding redistricting. What if individuals uh, send it, or uh, read it, and then contact their assembly, um, urging support? And the other question is, do you believe we could sway Sheila Harstor? <laughs> so the first question, great idea. <laughs> Get that, get that Dunn County resolution, which is an advisory resolution that's, that calls for uh, nonpartisan redistricting by the state, by the state legislature. And yes, yeah, send that to Sheila Harstor <coughs> if you're in her district. Um, send it to anybody. Send it to her if you just live near her district, because chances are you know folks who live in her district, and she, she will know that too. We had a group about this big pester her when she showed up to the town yeah. meeting here. So. We, we discussed that with her at some length. We could not get her to answer it. Very good. She well, just kept saying, everybody does it. It's just how it is. There's nothing we can do about it. Here, here's one possibility. She was just reelected in 16. It's very possible this is her last term in the Senate. And we know for guys like Luther Olson, we know it's his last term. Uh, it doesn't affect them. So maybe they vote that way. And they couldn't, and, they, and maybe they don't care at that point about the leadership telling them what to do. I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying it's worth a shot. We think that's the case with Olson because you know they don't want their legacy to be all bad. I mean, some of them, some of them want their legacy to be yes, we did finally, you know, what was right. So anyway, you, you and, and the, the, I would suggest with with someone like Harshmore, look, you were a supporter in the past. We understand the pressures that your party and the the changes, you know, blah 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 blah. Could you consider doing it? We would, you know, just positive or 
Because obviously the hammering over and it's not going to work. Okay. No, Maybe Jeff can get a deal. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's a, a good idea. And she's um, and somebody in their last session, or their, la their last term, you know, they're thinking about their legacy, and they they aren't as concerned as Jay said about about leadership. The other thing is. This is uh, the, something you said reminded me. This is the year we've got to get this done yeah. because by next next term, which will be in well, what uh, in 18, or 1920, that's going to be too close to. I meant 2019, 2020. <laughs> um, by that time, you know, more people will be more of the legislators will be looking at their own electoral chances and it'll be that much harder to, to pass it. It's gotta be this year. And also Dunn County has passed it, but we have we have nine eight or nine counties so far across the state. This is a we've been revving this around and passing this on through counties and our goal is to get the majority of the counties passed and that's added pressure and using that leverage that they are elected officials as well. And they're saying this is what our constituents want. Yeah. And I know there are people here from Pepin County, and there's people here from Eau Claire County and Chippewa County. So find out what's happening in your own county. Or by talk the way, to the Jeff. last five counties that have done it were carried by Trump. I'm not saying that's right. Mm -hmm. and that's fine. I have a, a last question, and I, I'm reluctant to ask it because it kind of leads us on a negative note. What happens if the Supreme Court takes the case? and then it's defeated and it, we don't i just so i don't want to really ask this as a but it, it's a real issue well that is something that uh, just will never happen <laughs> 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 no, it, you know look it's i mean how many times have we been disappointed um, what, what will we do well, we get well, well that's <laughs> You know, the, the one the one thing I agree with John McCain, he once said it's always dark is before it goes completely black. <laughs> so, the, so there's that. <laughs> so that would be pretty dark. That's really awesome. <laughs> That's dark. <laughs> we'll face that when we come. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's amazing to me is seeing uh, you know the people coming out to um, to forums like these this year. It's if this is something that after the 2011 redistricting, people were all upset, and I thought, well, this will last a year or two. You know, I, I don't, I've been, that, that was the only redistricting when I've been working for the league, and I thought, hmm, wonder how long this lasts. This, it has been seven years, and um, people are more upset than ever, and people are more um, energized than ever, and more of us are that way, and so I think you know we have a chance, and we just have to keep fighting. And thanks to a group like Je like Jeff, Jeffs, and others, a lot more people know about it now. Yeah. You know, it's just it's always been the leading common cause, but now, my gosh, it's it's uh, citizen it's action, it's organizing for America, it's indivisible. Fair maps for Wisconsin. Fair maps for Wisconsin. There's all these other groups that have, have joined. And by the way, you have groups that never used to. I, the Wisconsin <laughs> Nurses Association. Oh. Now I, I've talked to them. They're going to be part of it. I mean, so a lot of citizens get that this is important for things like health care and everything else. Yeah. Is there? Excuse my voice. Is there a real simplistic uh, written out? Uh, something that we could use someplace if we're going to write it? Like uh, editorials sure. or uh, write letters or do something that understandable? <laughs> we don't. Well, never mind. We want fair voting maps. We don't think that we want to elect our representatives. Uh, we want to choose our representatives rather than have them choose their voters. I mean, that's about as simple, I think, as you can get. But you know, the best thing is in your own words. I mean, yeah. however you understand the issue. Well, the, the most important thing is if you relate it to your concern. Say, I'm concerned about health care. We can get you talking yeah. points. Yeah. Yeah. If you're concerned about health care or any other issue, natural resources, whatever, and you're finding that your legislators don't listen to you, 
There's a reason. That's because they're safe in their in their districts. Yeah. Now, does the league have something on their positions or the common cause on their yes. positions that explains yeah. us all of that? Yes. Yep. Go to our website. So go to the website, and there will be yes. something that explains the position. What Andrea just said, bottom line, wraps it all up. That is why this is the most important issue in our democracy because they don't need to listen to you. That is why they get 300 calls on one issue one way and zero the other way and still vote for the zero because they are so full of themselves. They are so confident that they have drawn these maps for themselves that they don't have to listen to you. That's why we are now leaving the Paris Accord. That's why we're we're destroying, we're, we're we're poisoning our water, which we're going to hear more about in September, which I'm glad to hear um, here. So that's why these things are happening. Yeah, there's one state senator. Uh, her name is Leah Buchmeier. She's uh, she's going to run for the U.S. Senate. She's very far right. She actually has said publicly, "I don't have to listen to people who don't agree with me." Okay, it also was that? to the editor to say, you know, my representative got 300 calls. I yes. Some, yeah. Is that a good letter to yes. the editor and say, no one, you know, I mean, Name your name is sad. I mean, so if you get that kind of information from your legislator, use it. Ask them. If you say they Representative they Kathleen Bernier got 300 calls, she's going to read that letter. <laughs> so I think we need to call today and they'll be both. Andrea and, and Jay will be here for a few minutes if you have other questions. Or if you have other questions about a league, you can uh, talk to somebody over here at the table. So thank you very much for coming.